Great, welcome. I, uh, I'm Kai Mei Fu, I'm a professor in the physics department here and a member of the Frontier in Physics Lecture Series Committee and it is a great privilege to welcome you to David Charbonneau's talk um, within our series. The goal of the Frontiers in Physics Lecture Series is to bring to the University of Washington and to Seattle um, public lectures on the most exciting developments in physics given by the scientists who are at the forefront of making these discoveries. The semi-annual lecture series seeks to be as broad as the field we're trying to represent. We are representing. The past five lectures has led us through the detection of gravitational waves, the development of clocks based on single atoms, which are able to detect the change in the rate of time due to an elevation of one foot, and it has allowed us to follow a thread that could link a mass extinction on Earth to dark matter in our universe. If you are new to these series and any of these sound intriguing, they are all um, online right now, videotaped, so you're welcome to go and, and take a look at these past presentations. And tonight, we'll learn about recent discoveries that may help us determine how probable it is that life other than ours exists in our galaxy. This series would not be possible without the tireless work of the Frontiers of Physics Lecture Series Committee and the generosity of private support. So I want to take a moment to thank uh, the committee. If you could please stand. And also the benefactors Dr. Patrick O'Hara and Dr. Katerina Randolph, whose vision it is, is the reason why we're sitting in this lecture hall today. Okay. If you enjoy this series and are looking for ways to further your own engagement with physics, further the public's engagement in physics, or even further physics itself, the frontiers of physics, um, Feel free to contact me after the lecture. Come up and talk to me. Contact our department. Um, just send me an email. Send the department chair at physics, uw.physics.edu. <laughs> Blaine will thank me for that. No, really, you should reach out um, to us. It can be as simple as inviting your daughter to the lecture tonight or inviting your neighbors to share the joy that we have uh, in physics. It could be supporting an inspiring young woman to go to the undergraduate, um, the, the conference for uh, undergraduate women in physics, which actually we are proud to host at University of Washington this year, and we just got 284 applications yeah. from the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. And it could also be as large as supporting a young aspiring, uh, as supporting a fellowship for a graduate student. So uh, some of you may know that David Charbonneau was the first person to observe the transit of an exoplanet in front of a star. What you may not know was that he did this as a graduate student in a parking lot in Colorado with a four-inch telescope, <laughs> right? So, it is not a very well-kept secret that the people who are on the ground doing the work, making the discoveries, are our graduate students, and we're very proud of them at University of Washington and beyond. Okay. So, moving on to introducing David. Professor Charbonneau is currently a professor of astronomy at Harvard University and the principal investigator for the MIRTH project to detect hab habitable planets and for the NASA Spitzer and Hubble Space Telescope studies of exoplanets. From that very first transiting exoplanet observation, he's been at the forefront of exoplanet research, including the first measurement of an exoplanet atmosphere, the first detection of light from an exoplanet, and the first discovery of an Earth-sized exoplanet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charbonneau to the University of Washington. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. All right, if you take 
a camera and you open up the shutter and you point it at the night sky, all right, this is what you get, okay? It's stars all the way down. And it's not a surprise to you that our galaxy contains 300 billion stars. And our galaxy is perhaps only one of 300 billion galaxies in the observable universe. So uh, it seems to me it's a very natural question to wonder whether or not we are alone. Uh, we are not the first generation to ask that question. In fact, if you look back in the written record throughout human history, you can see that humans have, have wondered about whether or not, well, this is it, okay? Here we see in writing from Epicurus uh, more than 2,000 years ago, and Epicurus wrote in a letter, there is an infinite number of worlds, some like this world and others unlike it, some of these worlds contain the seeds out of which animals and plants arise and all the rest of the things we see. So, so long before we understood that the points of light in the night sky were stars and then there might be planets around those stars, we still had this yearning uh, to know whether there were somehow other uh, populated worlds that we could come into contact with. If we zoom ahead and look back only 450 years or so, we see now much more concrete thinking about where that life might be, okay? And so here is some writing by Giordano Bruno. He was a friar, and he said, there are countless suns and countless earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the planets of our system. The countless worlds are no worse and no less inhabited than our earth, okay? So um, what is so special, why I'm so excited, is that although humans have wondered about this for thousands of years, we are the special generation that for the first time in human history is gonna have the technological ability, if we choose, if we choose, to go and answer this great question. So why, why has progress been so slow? Why didn't Giordano get to make these discoveries? So, um, so, so let's think a little bit about how we want to go and find out about whether or not there's life on other planets. So, so we're going to consider different ways of approaching this problem. Okay, so here's one idea. What, what's that? Spaceship, spaceship, okay? Let's, let's build spaceships, right? Let's build spaceships, let's go to other planets, and let's see whether uh, they've got uh, life on them. That would, that would be great, wouldn't that be great? So um, I'm, I love spaceships, I love Star Trek. Uh, uh, this is not uh, the way we're gonna make these first discoveries, okay? If you take the fastest uh, uh, spacecraft that we've ever built and you pointed it directly at the closest star, it would still take more than 50,000 years, 50,000 years for that spacecraft to get there. We simply do not know how to accelerate things to a high enough velocity to get to the other stars, okay? There are people thinking about spaceships, and it's very exciting, but that's not how we're gonna make these first discoveries. So uh, let's, let's think about another idea, right? Yeah, right? Fantastic movie, like I cried, like I still cry. I watch it with my four daughters, and I really cry if you know the plot of this story, okay? And, and, and so, uh, you know, uh, maybe we should be listening for aliens. And again, I don't mean, I mean, there are people working on this, and I'm really excited that they're working on this, but I don't believe, and I think what I'm gonna tell you about today, I don't believe this is the way to make, uh, to make those first discoveries. And, and the reason is, in this case, you know, I think when you start requiring that life not just be alive, but that it be intelligent, that it wants to communicate, that it's interested in radio telescopes, that is a very narrow search for life. That's really looking for other humans. And there may be other humans out there, but I'm gonna advocate that we need to create and cast the broadest net possible when we go and actually make the first search for life uh, outside the solar system. So, uh, so what's the challenge? Okay, here's the challenge. So here's the Earth. This is, this is the kind of thing we wanna find. Uh, this planet is great. Everything you uh, have experienced, all the great writing and human thought and poetry and complicated politics we're all experiencing at the moment, it all belongs here on this planet. And uh, the first thing we gotta know is this planet is really small. 
Okay, so let me compare this planet to another planet uh, in our solar system, right? That's Jupiter. So drawn to scale, that's how big the Earth is compared to Jupiter. Okay, so the Earth is really, really small compared to even other planets in our own system. And, and of course, the trick when we're looking at other stars is that the, the light from the star overwhelms the planets. So let's, let's now put these two planets drawn to scale uh, next to the sun, okay? So, so that's the correct size of the Earth compared to the sun. And you can immediately see what the challenge is and why poor Giordano had no chance of actually finding uh, Earth-like planets around other uh, sun-like stars. So, um, so what's the trick? What allowed us to suddenly make progress? And actually, I showed it to you at the very beginning. Did you catch it? It's not, it's, did you, did you, it's not a period. It's not a period, OK? That's an actual image. It's not photoshopped. That's a true image of the sun. At a very special moment, uh, a few years ago, June 20, 2012, anybody? What happened? Venus. Venus went in front of the sun. If you didn't see it, not a problem. The next one is 103 years from now. <laughs> so, sorry. But um, so, so this, this idea that, uh, that planets occasionally go in front of their stars, that's the hook. That's the way we're going to get at this um, question. And in particular, something, something very exciting happens when planets pass in front of their stars. Okay? If we zoom in, if we zoom in on Venus, okay, this is, this is Venus now, okay? So the sun, the sun drawn to now would go way, you know, several stories below us. So I'm just zoomed in on Venus. And this is when Venus is just creeping onto the limb of the sun, okay? <clears throat> in 1761, okay, a Russian scientist by the name of Lomonosov first observed that even before Venus was entirely within the confines of the sun, the outer limb of Venus was bright. And he said, ah, that must be refraction. And what we're seeing is light being bent by an atmosphere, and therefore Venus has an atmosphere like the Earth has an atmosphere. And it was a remarkable inference, and he was right. He was right. It, this, this, is, this is proof uh, hundreds of years ago that, that, that Venus had an atmosphere. That's the idea that we're going to use to begin exploring other planets. So, uh, so here's, here's kind of uh, the task for today. These are the big three things I want to make sure you don't leave without me covering, okay? The first is I want to describe the methods by which we find and characterize planets. You have to know how we're actually doing it to understand what we can measure and what we can't measure. Then I want to, I want to get to describing our current state of knowledge of Earth-like planets. What, what have we actually learned? And, it is amazing to think, you know, if I, had, if I had given this talk a year ago, how much less I would have been able to tell you, how much has happened really just in the last 12 months. And then, and then, and then at the end, we're going to talk about the first opportunity for really going and actually not just finding Earth-like planets, but actually planets that actually have life on them and how we would actually make that inference. So, uh, so the methods. Let's start with the methods, right? Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, one way to find planets, and that's called the Doppler method, uh, or the radial velocity method, or the wobble method. And the basic idea is the following. The star, the star is not stationary. The star and the planet actually orbit each other. The star doesn't move very much, because it's much more massive. So picture it as like uh, two dance partners. There are two dance partners holding hands. But one dance partner weighs 300,000 times more than the other dance partner. <laughs> Okay, so one, one, one partner's being really swung around, that's the planet. The trouble is the planets don't put out light, so you don't see that. But you do see this one dance partner that's kind of, you know, and, and what you can measure is that the star is changing speed. It's sometimes coming towards you and sometimes receding, and that's periodic. And, and, and that's the way that we can find planets, and in particular, because the mass of the planet affects how much it changes the speed of the star, we can deduce the mass of the planet this way. Okay, got it, that's method number one. Method number two is the transit method, and that's, that's the Venus idea we talked about. The planet goes in front of the star. Unlike the case for Venus, we don't actually get to take a picture and see a black dot in front of a resolved star, but we can measure the total brightness of the star, and we can see that the star is fainter, 
when the planet's in front. And, and big planets block more light. So, so by measuring how much light is blocked, we can deduce how big the planet is. And then, and then we can put those ideas uh, together. Okay, so if, if, if the planet is a, is a sphere, and we know the mass of the sphere, and we know the size of the sphere, we can figure out the density without any assumptions. Very simple, very, very simple idea, really hard to do, by the way, but a very simple idea. And, and then you can get the density. And of course, if the density is the same as, say, hydrogen, then the planet might be made of hydrogen. If the density is much higher, similar to that of rock, maybe, maybe we found a rocky planet. Okay? All right. So those, those are the principal methods. Now, the other thing that transits do is they allow us to probe the atmosphere. Okay? So the planet will pass in front of the star, and what's going to happen is that some of the light from the star is going to go through the atmosphere of the planet during those few hours, and then it's going to travel through space, and you're going to detect it with your telescope. And then you can see that during these times of transit, uh, the chemical fingerprints of whatever molecules or atoms or clouds or the conditions are in the atmosphere are, are captured by that light as it passes through the atmosphere. And like fingerprints, we can then look at that light and say, oh, there's uh, water or there's methane or there's whatever gases are present in, in, the, in the atmosphere of the planet. Okay? Now, this, um, uh, this idea of transiting plants has really taken off. So in 2001, in 2001, okay, we knew of one such planet. There was one planet uh, outside the solar system that actually made these transits. And now in 2018, there's more than 5,000 such planets. Okay, so it really is a special moment in human history. How, how will studying the atmosphere tell us that there's life? Right? Well, if, if, if you were an alien astronomer doing this experiment on the planets of the solar system, you would see that there's something really special and different about the third planet from the sun. Okay, and that's because life has radically changed the content of our atmosphere. And, and, and for example, one of the things life has done is produced a lot of oxygen, right? It's a, it's a waste product for plants. It's unintentional, getting back to this idea of should we be listening for radio signals. Here, we're going to try to detect life through the unintentional uh, uh, waste products that are just produced as life goes about its business, okay? So, so life is going to change the chemical content of the atmosphere. We now have a way to study the atmosphere by the passage of light through that atmosphere. And, um, and this process has been going on throughout, throughout the four and a half billion years of, of the Earth's history. Okay, so to, to make these measurements, we're going to need really, really powerful observatories. Okay, you can remember, think about how big the sun was and how small the Earth was. And now we're not just trying to study, detect the Earth, but actually just detect the little onion skin of atmosphere, the little thin the thin atmosphere just surrounding the tiny dot of the Earth. And you can imagine it's a really difficult measurement to make. So it takes big telescopes. Fortunately, we are, uh, uh, as a national community, we, we are, with the astronomers and, and, and NASA, are building uh, an incredibly powerful observatory that we hope will launch in 2021. That's the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay? So you might have heard about this in the news. It has been delayed, and it is over budget. And I am frustrated. It should not be delayed and over budget. But nonetheless, we are very close to completing it, and this will revolutionize essentially all major branches of astrophysics. For us, for the exoplaneteers, it, of course, provides something essential. It's a large telescope, right? If you're looking for that little atmosphere just for those few hours that the planet's in front, you have to gather a lot of information. You have to gather a lot of light. And having a big telescope in space allows us to do that. Also, the James Webb Space Telescope is very sensitive to infrared light. Why do we like infrared light? Infrared is where all the molecules we want to study, okay, so methane and water, they all uh, show their fingerprints in infrared light, right? The same reason we have the greenhouse effect, right? That's going on at infrared wavelengths, okay, because of CO2 and water. That's the same signals that we're trying to detect. So we have to have a large infrared space telescope, and that's exactly what the James Webb Space Telescope will be, okay? What about on, um, oh, and, and, I wanted, and I want to show you some update photos of, of James Webb, okay? So James Webb uh, was assembled at the NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center in Maryland, 
okay? And I got to see it just before it shipped out. Uh, the mirrors have this beautiful gold color because of those infrared wavelengths that they want to study. It was then uh, shipped to uh, uh, Houston uh, for testing. And here we can see the enormous chamber. This is what we have at NASA, are these enormous testing chambers. Because of course we have to simulate uh, the, the thermal changes that the telescope will experience in space. And we have to be able to put the telescope in a vacuum, just like it'll be in space. And if anything breaks, actually fix it without having to go up to space, okay? So uh, these tests were done, and you can see there was a very careful measurement. Will it fit? I don't know if you are big into parallel parking, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> it, it barely fits. And, uh, and indeed, uh, uh, that, that's where the testing was done. Uh, so we hope very much that JWST will, will launch uh, in the next uh, couple of years. Now, um, on the ground, of course, we can build even bigger telescopes. And so there's uh, an, uh, a big effort in the United States to lead the construction of two giant telescopes, one in the northern hemisphere, one in the southern hemisphere. My, my institution, Harvard, is part of the effort to build the one in the southern hemisphere, which is called the Giant Magellan Telescope, okay? Uh, and it's an international effort, too. We have, we have partners with Australia, we're in partnership with Korea, so, so these are big projects and we need big international collaborations. This, this uh, telescope, when it, when it goes online, uh, which we hope will be about 2023, will be the largest optical telescope ever constructed, okay? It's going to be uh, enormous and thus be able to gather an enormous amount of light and really be able to probe these exoplanet uh, atmospheres. Just to show you how big it is, okay? So these are the mirrors that will go into the telescope. We have cast five of these seven mirrors, okay? We've put them into the big molds with the glass, melted the glass. Um, we do this under the football stadium at the University of Arizona because that's the only place on campus that's big enough to actually house these sorts of mirrors. And you basically put in the glass and melt it and you spin this entire dish and that creates the shape that you want because the glass is a liquid. And then you cool it slowly over months so that it doesn't crack. Um, when those mirrors are cast, they look like this. That's one of the mirrors, okay? That's this middle mirror with a donut in the middle. Okay, that's what people are sitting on. It hasn't been polished yet, that's why it doesn't look silver. But that's the actual mirror. So we've cast five of these, and we're trying to, to build the other two. Now for perspective, right, remember I talked about the James Webb being much bigger than anything else we've launched in space. The James Webb mirror is six and a half meters. That would be, um, that would fit tidally within one of these mirrors, okay? These are eight and a half meters, and so you can see how much bigger things can be on the ground. <clears throat> so, um, so here's the idea. So we have these unprecedented observatories that are being built. They're being built for general reasons in astrophysics. They, they do all sorts of things with galaxies and cosmology, okay? But for us, for studying exoplanet atmospheres, they do this really precious thing, which is finally they give us the sensitivity to actually study the atmospheres of planets. And so the idea is working together, can these telescopes, like the Giant Magellan Telescope, and the James Webb Space Telescope allow us to get at these, these precious little uh, atmospheres, okay? So, uh, and the answer is yes, they can. But there's only one little challenge, right? Which is we actually don't have the targets. We actually don't yet have the planets to point them at. So we're building these facilities, they're gonna, they're gonna come online uh, in perhaps three to five years. Uh, but we better figure out, we better have the targets, the planets ready to go that we want to probe with them. So uh, let's go back to talking about actually finding planets, okay? So uh, I just wanted to remind you of the challenge. This is the sun and the earth. Does everybody see the earth? Earth? No, it's not. No, those are spots. Those are sunspots, which are much bigger than the earth. Did you know that? The sunspots are bigger than the earth? That's the earth. Right there, I think. My eyes, it's not great. Yep, that's it. Right there. So that's, that's the Earth. Uh, and so um, finding the Earth, like forget about just studying the atmosphere, but you can imagine seeing the fraction of light blocked. It's about 84 parts per million. A tiny, tiny little signal as, as Earth-like planets go in front of their sun-like stars. That's how we're going to find these planets, okay? And so our field, uh, there was a revolutionary experiment in our field 
that actually kind of opened the treasure chest and moved us from studying big planets, which we had been doing. We'd been studying Jupiters and that story about the parking lot. That was, a, that was the reason we could do that from the ground with a small telescope. That was a big Jupiter-sized planet. But to study uh, these small rocky planets, we really needed a powerful new, to new, new tool. And that, that was the NASA Kepler mission. Okay? And it's really difficult to overstate the impact of Kepler on the field of exoplanets. Um, Kepler uh, is, a, is, a, is a telescope that looked at uh, one patch of the sky. It looked at the same 150,000 stars for four years uninterrupted. Why, why four years? Because the Earth-like planets take a year to go around, and you want to see several of those passages to convince yourself there really is a planet. So it had to be able to look at the same stars for at least three to four years, and that's what it did. Okay? Then um, in about 2013, uh, one of the... One of the um, Devices inside the telescope that allowed it to point accurately failed, it broke, but the telescope was still operating and so it moved to a new mission, which is still to find planets, but not those kind of Earth-like Earth planets around sun-like stars that we've been talking about. So the main data came in between 2009 and 2013. And this is just showing you the actual launch, there's the spacecraft, and that's the actual uh, digital camera that we used. Um, this, this is what it means to find an exoplanet. These are, are what the data look like, okay? So um, here I'm plotting as a function of time in days, okay? So 200 days, 400 days, 600 days, 800 days. So several years of data, got it, okay? And I'm plotting the brightness of one star. Kepler, there's 150,000 of these light curves. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna, I wasn't gonna show you 150,000. I'll just show you the one, okay? And, and you can see that mostly there's not much going on, okay? Uh, the, the star doesn't change the brightness. There's these gaps, you see these gaps? That's just when the spacecraft uh, stopped gathering data for a moment. Maybe it was downlinking its data, but nothing, nothing surprising. And, uh, and then is there anything else in this light curve of note? Yes, what are these guys, right? So, so what these are are moments when the star suddenly gets fainter for a few hours, and then it returns to its brightness. And th that's the passage of, uh, of, a, of a planet in front of the star, okay? And so um, you don't need a computer to find those, and so you can basically say, oh, I can measure the, the orbital period, the year for that planet, and, you can, and then you can cut the data up into chunks and fold, or, fold it over, and you can see this very nice signal. So if I zoom in on each of these, and I plot them over on top of each other, I get this. Okay, so that's, that's what it looks like for a planet to go in front of, in front of the star. But, but with a computer, you can dig down more into the noise and ask, are there other periodic signals? And the answer is yes, there are. There's another one, here's another one. Okay, here's another one right here. And this, this signal is buried down in the noise. You really can't see that one with your eye, okay? And this was a, a, a just one of thousands of exoplanet discoveries. So in this case, you've got two planets going around the same star. One of the planets is big because it blocks a lot of light. One of the planets is small, okay? So that's just, that's illustrative. Now, Kepler found all sorts of planets, okay? Hot Jupiters and, and mini Neptunes and super Earths, and we had to actually invent all sorts of new words because a lot of the planets were unlike anything we'd found in the solar system, okay? And that was, and that was one of the big surprises. But, uh, but what we, of course, really wanted to know was how common were Earth-like planets, okay? Planets that were roughly the same size as the Earth and the same temperature as the Earth. And so uh, what that means is we want planets to be in, in what we call the habitable zone. So the habitable zone is like the Goldilocks zone, okay? So the idea is if the, if the planet, if you take the planet, you make the planet, the planet's got water, among other things, but it, it ends up too close to the star, then the water uh, is a gas, right? So the water evaporates, not, not habitable, okay? Uh, or uh, if, if the planet is too cold, then the oceans freeze, okay? And so again, you, you don't have uh, a habitable world. So you need to be just in this, in this, in this intermediate zone. And, um, and so uh, uh, I had the pleasure a few years ago of working with a graduate student named Courtney Dressing. And uh, Courtney uh, wanted to know what is the rate of occurrence for the typical star in the galaxy? How often do they host a planet that's the same size and same temperature, i.e. rocky and, and would have liquid water on its surface as the Earth? And, and Courtney was the first human, I believe, was the first human to ever know the answer to that question. Thanks to, the, thanks to the use of the Kepler data, okay? 
And, uh, and, and the answer really mattered a lot to us because if the answer, the answer could have been one in a million, right? Maybe, maybe those plants are really rare. If it's one in a million, uh, then the impact is that if you wanna find the closest one to us, right? So the, so the Kepler stars, we are not gonna study these planets in detail. Kepler looked at a group of stars that were actually quite far away. So it was good at telling us statistics, but we can't study those planets in detail anyway. But if we wanted to find the closest example of that population and study it, but the rate of occurrence is one in a million, that means we would still have to look so far away that there was no hope of actually scrutinizing that planet in detail. If on the other hand, the, the rate of occurrence was relatively high, it would mean that there was a path forward. And so, you know, Courtney very carefully uh, had to do a lot of work to do this calculation to, to actually measure the sizes of the stars and therefore the size of the planets. And she arrived at the answer. And the answer is one in four, okay? One in four, so one in four, uh, typical stars in the galaxy has a planet that's, we think, broadly speaking, what we would call habitable, okay? And uh, Courtney has done quite well. She's now a professor at Berkeley, which is a small technical college, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, all right. So uh, now, if we wanna really get at the atmospheres, okay, uh, then, uh, then, then what's the challenge, okay? So the challenge is, we need stars that are not too far away, okay? As things are closer to us, they are brighter, okay? So we need the closest possible stars, and our ability to study the atmospheres is limited by the fact that many of the targets we wanna study are simply too far away. So we need to be able to look at the closest stars. And um, the size of the star compared to the planet really matters, okay? So, uh, so you remember, you know, if we have a really big star, then the planet is tiny, the atmosphere is really tiny, it's really hard to scrutinize the atmosphere. If, if somehow we could magically make the problem easier, then uh, we should do that because it'll give us access with the same size telescope to more planetary atmospheres. So, um, uh, so I often tell the story that in high school, I was told a terrible lie. I was told, I hope you've never lied to by your teachers. I was lied to by my teachers. I was told that the sun is an average star. Were you ever told this? All right, so it's a, it's a big fat uh, lie. The sun uh, is not an average star. The sun is a freak. The sun is much bigger and, and more massive and more luminous, puts out a lot more energy uh, than the typical star in the galaxy, okay? So the typical star in the galaxy is what we call a red dwarf, one of these red dwarf stars. And compared to the sun, they're about a quarter the size of the sun, uh, maybe a quarter the mass of the sun and they only put about one one thousandth the amount of energy per unit time that the sun does. So they're like these little Christmas tree lights, okay, that are, that are, that are populating the galaxy. So, so that's the typical kind of star. The sun is, the sun is actually a very strange star. Now, if you're, if you're willing to be open-minded, and I advocate, uh, since we know nothing about life in the universe, we should, we should cast a wide net, uh, what would the habitable zone look like around these these M dwarf stars, okay? And so drawn to scale, right, the idea of the habitable zone is the following. So here's a sun, here's the sun, and you know, uh, if you're too close to the sun, then water boils, and if you're too far away, water freezes. But there's some range of distances, okay, around the sun where you can put your planet and water's gonna be liquid. For these M dwarf stars, these red dwarf stars, okay, that zone is shrunken in because they put out a lot less energy. So, so, you know, it's like if I turn on a, a heater, turn on a light, and I stand at a certain distance and I'm comfortable, and now I turn that down by a factor of 1,000, you imagine you'd want, to, you'd want to stand a lot closer before you find the place where you're comfortable once again. And that's exactly what this, that, that blue region, that's the Goldilocks zone around these uh, M dwarf stars, okay? So um, that's, that's a benefit for planet hunters. And the reason is that to be in the habitable zone around a sun-like star, basically it takes a year for you to orbit your star. So if we're doing a transit search, if we're looking for these eclipses, we have to wait a year between events. But now, if the habitable zone is shrunken and close, then uh, you only have to wait 10 days. The, the planets only take 10 days to go around their stars. And so that's a huge uh, perk because uh, we can get the job done in much less time. The other, the other interesting thing to note about these uh, red dwarfs is uh, how populous they are, okay? how, how common they are. So um, if I, if I uh, take, take a part, small part of the galaxy 
and I draw a bubble around the sun. And I count up all the stars in that bubble. And I'm going to go out to 10 parsecs. OK, so that's just like the, the local, local, like Millennium Falcon kind of distance, right? That's whatever that really means. That the tiny, tiny volume of space, and I count up all the stars. That's about, um, yeah, 30 light years, 33 light years. OK, it's very interesting to ask, you know, what, what, what kind of stars do you encounter? So there's actually, it's very interesting, there's 20 white dwarfs. White dwarfs are the dead corpses of sun-like stars. And uh, once they die, they don't go away. They just stay there. So over time, these have accumulated. So there's kind of this graveyard around. And there's 20 of those guys. And then we give stars, uh, and this is, a, this is a Harvard invention, we give them a very complicated letter name that doesn't mean much, so sorry. But we, we, we call the very massive, the really bright stars, we call them O stars and B stars. There's none of those. But if you go down to what we call G stars, that's the sun. The sun is called the G star. There's 20 of those in this volume of space, OK? The question is, how many, how many uh, red dwarfs are there in the same volume of space? So let's, let's have a look. There they are. OK. So there's 20 G dwarfs, but there are 246 M dwarfs. OK. So they outnumber us 12 to 1. So, uh, so if uh, they make planets, and they make planets the same size as the Earth and the same temperature, and they do, because that's what Courtney told us, uh, then, um, then surely uh, they're an interesting place to go and actually look for whether there's actually life on those, on those planets. Okay? So that's what I set out to do in a project uh, called the MIRTH project. Okay? So the, the idea, why do we call it MIRTH? Because we're looking for Earth-like planets around M dwarfs, right? MIRTH. Also, it makes us happy. MIRTH, happy, good. You're with me? Okay, happy. Uh, and so what is MIRTH? So MIRTH is uh, a collection of robotic telescopes, okay? So it's, it's eight robotic telescopes in Arizona and eight robotic telescopes in, uh, in Chile. And uh, why do we have robotic telescopes? That's because we want to find planets that go in front of, that eclipse uh, these, these nearby M dwarfs. So they're all over, like we're in the middle of a swarm of these, of these M dwarf stars. They're all around us. And so they're in every direction. So I need a whole bunch of telescopes because I need to be able to take a telescope and say, look at star number one, and then look at star number two, and star number three, and repeat that while we're waiting for these eclipses to occur. OK, I can't just do it with one telescope. Uh, so here's another view of the observatory. This is the observatory in Chile. OK, so there they are. Um, they're, they're, they're each 16 inches in, in the mirrors, about 16 inches. So if I were to stand next to these telescopes, they'd sort of be my height. OK, so they're, rel they're relatively modest in size. And, um, uh, and uh, then they're located uh, some in the north and some in the south. So why do we do that? Because it uh, could be that the closest uh, aliens to us uh, are in the southern hemisphere or in the northern hemisphere. We need to look at all this. We can't just look at half the sky. Okay, that's why we had to build two observatories. And then I wanted to show you a time-lapse movie of the observatory in operation. Okay? So the observatory runs every night. It should be running tonight. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Okay? So these are the telescopes that are frantically searching the different stars. Now, this telescope is looking at 20 different stars, but I'm just going to plot the data from one particular star, and this is just on one night. And so it's measuring the star. This is the brightness of the star. It doesn't look very interesting. Oh, this telescope has suddenly noticed that that point is lower than these points. So the star is suddenly fainter. So the telescope stops what it's doing. It stops its survey mode, and it stares at that one star until that star brightens up again. And then it goes back to its observing. So this happens in real time. OK? And this is great. I'm home with my family. It's robotic. <laughs> you know, I can have a beer. It's great. We can, we can hang out. I, I, my four daughters all play hockey. I'm their hockey coach, so that's a lot of fun. And, uh, and then the observatory goes and finds the planet. I want to pause and say this is all due to the incredibly hard work of the project scientist, a guy named Jonathan Irwin. He is the maestro that makes this happen uh, and has really you know, constructed MIRTH and created the data analysis pipeline and also gets to send me the cool email saying, ah, we got one. And that's what happened when we found this planet. Um, so, um, so we have found a number of planets uh, over the years. I want to tell you about one of them, okay? And that's the discovery of a, of a temperate, meaning sort of Earth temperature, rocky planet uh, transiting a nearby star. Okay, and at the time, it was the first planet that was the first such planet where we knew it was the same temperature as the Earth, and we knew it was rocky. We actually knew it was rocky. Okay, 
And so um, uh, there was this totally unremarkable anonymous star. It was so anonymous it had this catalog name, LHS 1140. Okay, boring name. Okay, and it was one of the one of the 2,000 stars that we were searching. And all of a sudden we noticed that uh, it got fainter by about half a percent. So just a tiny change in brightness. Okay, um, uh, and we saw this one event, like I showed you in the movie. We saw this one event. And then we, we kept looking at the star, but it didn't, it didn't recur. We didn't see another transit. So we thought, did we get it wrong? And uh, what we instead did is we went and used that other method. We started the Doppler. Remember I talked about the dancing, the dance partners? So we went back and did the Doppler monitoring. And we could see that the star was changing its velocity. The star was changing its speed, coming towards us and going away from us. But on a much longer time scale than we had thought. Normally we find planets that go around the star every day or two. This planet took 25 days to go around, and that meant it was going to be a relatively cool planet, not a super hot Earth. Okay? Um, and so, um, so indeed, uh, we have discovered this planet. It's got a terrible name. If the star is called, so, so, so in astronomy, when we find a planet around a star, we take the name of the star, which in this case is LHS 1140, and the planet is LHS 1140 B. <laughs> Isn't that awful? It's awful. It's really awful. So, uh, so the planet is a little bit bigger than the Earth, okay, 40% one one bigger than the Earth. Uh, and uh, just to show you to scale what this looks like, if that's the sun, okay, that's the star. That's not the planet. That's the star, the little red dwarf. And then that's, that's the planet right there, okay? And uh, then we measured the wobble. That's the wobble that tells us the mass of the planet, and that allowed us to determine it really was rocky. And then I can draw the entire system to scale. Okay, so drawn, everything is drawn to scale. That's the distance between the star and the planet. That's the size of the star at that, at that same distance. And here's the little planet uh, over there. And it's, it's far enough away that this planet gets only about half the amount of energy that the Earth gets, which actually means it's squarely in the habitable zone. Okay, so, so if, you look at, if you look at our uh, solar system, the Earth is kind of at the inner edge of the habitable zone. If you're a little bit closer, we don't think the Earth would be habitable, right? Venus is not habitable. But the Earth could be a little bit farther away, and particularly for these red dwarfs, you can get a little bit less energy. So uh, there is a habitable uh, planet. Okay? Now, just recently, like, like just in the past few weeks, something interesting happened with this star. So, so we, um, after we'd found this planet, we went and used the um, NASA Spitzer Space Telescope, okay? And so that's an infrared observatory that can stare uninterrupted at stars, and it's really good at making light curves. And we were monitoring, we knew, once we figured out when these transits were happening, we were using that observatory every uh, 25 days to go and observe the next transit, just to see if anything uh, interesting showed up, okay? And so um, here's, uh, one of those uh, uh, data sets, okay, so this is the eclipse, right? So the star is bumping along and then it goes down. That's the expected planet going in front of the star. These data are very high quality because it's now being gathered in space and then it brightens back up again. At, at the time that we were doing this, a new graduate student, a guy named Christo Ment, uh, showed up and was working with me and he was very excited. He'd heard about machine learning. He said, I, I've heard machine learning is cool. And I want to use machine learning, but for astronomy. I said, okay, sounds great. He go take, so he went and took this really hard computer science course. Um, and for his final project, he was able to use the MIRTH data and actually uh, do a machine learning project. And he said, I think I found a planet. I think I found another. And I said, well, really, what star? And he said, well, it's actually, it's the star that you already have a planet about. I said, no, that, that Christo, I know you're a new grad student. It's exciting, <laughs> you know. Yeah, we call it, we actually do in our in the community we actually do we call it planet fever like we get like people get that excitement, but then they as they look at the data it goes away, right? And uh, he said, no, I'm pretty sure. And so I said, well, go talk to this guy Jason Dittman, who had been a previously graduate student but was now uh, working over at MIT as a postdoc because he has the Spitzer program. And Crystal walked in and Jason said, damn it, I knew that was a planet. <laughs> and there's the other planet. So. So, so they had independently discovered a second planet in the same system. And just to show you what you're looking at here, this is confusing, right? So the star is first passed by the big planet, the one we knew about, okay? But then it so happens at the time of these data were gathered, a second smaller planet also passed in front of the star. You can tell it's smaller because it blocks less light, right? The, that's the first planet. It blocks half a percent. This guy only blocks maybe a quarter of a percent, so it's a smaller planet, right? And also this planet 
is orbiting interior to the known planet. How do you know that? Because the, the duration is shorter, right? If this planet takes several hours to go in front of the star, this planet only takes about 45 minutes, so it must be going at a higher velocity. And you do that if you're orbiting a star, you're, you go around faster the closer you are. Okay? So, so what was so exciting is now we had this rocky planet system, right? So there's the star, there's the planet uh, that we think is in the habitable zone, LHS 1140 b, and sure enough, you find another planet. What exciting name do you think we give it? LHS 1140 c. But what's so exciting is basically you have this family of rocky planets. Okay, so this really starts to look and feel like the inner part of our own solar system, right? Multiple planets, they're all in the same orbital plane, uh, and they are similar in size to the Earth. Some are hot, and some are a little bit cooler, okay? Okay, so uh, where, do we go? where do we go from here? So we're gonna continue to operate MIRTH, but a number of us realized, uh, 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 really probably about a decade ago, that what we needed was a new space telescope. And that space telescope was gonna take the discoveries of the Kepler mission. Kepler told us the rate of occurrence of planets, but actually find the very closest examples. Kepler, like I said, it isn't looking at the closest stars. It was looking at a certain group of stars that were very far away, because it just looked at one patch of the sky. We needed a new observatory that could scour the whole sky from space and find all the very best small rocky planets, okay? And so that's called the NASA test mission, okay? So uh, uh, I'm a co-investigator on TESS. TESS, uh, our mission is to find hundreds of nearby small planets amenable to detailed characterization. So these are gonna be the very bestest, closest, uh, rockiest planets. There are not gonna be better planets. These are gonna be the best planets so that we can actually go and, and, and really characterize uh, their atmospheres. Uh, so uh, this was uh, 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 led by a guy named George Ricker at uh, MIT. And uh, this, is, this is what the project looks like, okay? So it's four camera lenses, and those former camera lenses are in the shroud here, and you can see humans for scale. So it's actually a relatively modest telescope, not, not very big. And uh, in April, uh, uh, just this year, uh, we got to launch pad, and uh, we were delayed a couple days, and then we, then we, then we launched. So it was super exciting. Uh, this, that happens to correspond to uh, spring vacation week in Boston. So uh, my, my whole family went down and, and we got to see this launch. Uh, and so uh, there it is taking off. So TESS is just tiny. This, just to, if you've never really kind of looked at rockets before, all of, this, all of this is propellant. And then in this thing, TESS would be smaller. TESS would be about the size of the laser dot in there. So all of that is just to get you into space, but TESS is actually really small, okay? Uh, so how does TESS uh, look at the sky, okay? So TESS has these four cameras, okay? There's four cameras in there. And each camera has a very, very large field of view, okay? Each camera will look at 24 degrees by 24 degrees. So that's like really if you took your hands and held them apart, a uh, couple arms, a couple hand width, that's the amount of sky they'd be blocking. So it's a huge part of the sky, a lot of stars in that part of the sky. And then the four cameras are pointed so that in one shot, it looks from the pole, it looks from the, what we call the ecliptic pole. So if you take the plane of the Earth's orbit, okay, the pole, if you look up towards the, the pole of that plane, then, then, then TESS looks from there all the way down uh, in one single snapshot. And this is kind of what we call the TESS salute because if you can kind of get your hands open enough, one camera points up and then the others work their way around, okay? And, and that's in one snapshot. It looks in one part of the sky for about 28 days and then it moves over to the adjacent sector. And so over the course of a year, it'll do 13 of these and it'll make its way around. And then the telescope flips over and it starts doing this in the Northern Hemisphere. So in two years, it surveys essentially the entire sky, okay? Spending 28 days on each part. Of course, at the, at the poles, right, where the same camera is not pointing at a new part of the sky, but actually just kind of rotating, you keep getting data. So actually, um, and some parts of the sky we look for a year. So that means we can find our longer period planets. But remember, I'm very interested in, in these M dwarf planets and their orbital periods are only like 10 or 20 days. So 28 days of data is already, is already pretty good. Uh, so TESS launched in April, started science observations in like late August, and by uh, beginning of September we had uh, the first planets. Okay, so, and, and what I love about TESS is TESS, the data are, are, uh, are uh, public. Uh, immediately. There's no proprietary period. 
for the scientists who are, were involved in building tests. Okay, so it's a NASA funded mission. Uh, sometimes with NASA missions, the scientists, uh, basically for all their hard work, they get a year or two to look at the data before it goes public. Here the data go public right away. So if you, you know, if anyone's interested, right now what we're trying to do is standardize the pipeline to release those data, but once that happens, any of you can look for planets just as I do. You can download the data on your computer, you can look for these signals. I kid you not. And you can be the first to see those planets. It's, it's, it's totally open. Okay, and so uh, here's uh, one of the first planets uh, I'm very excited about. Um, so uh, again, there's the TESS light curve. You can see this uh, eclipse. And uh, it's an ultra short period uh, uh, terrestrial planet, meaning kind of rocky planet. Now, unlike the planet I told you about earlier, which was in the habitable zone, this planet is definitely not in the habitable zone. This planet goes around every half day, every 12 hours, 11 hours actually, it goes around its star. So, uh, so it's, it's a really uh, roasted planet. But what's very excited, exciting about this is we want to know, does this planet, because it's so hot, did it actually hold on to its atmosphere? Or did it lose its atmosphere? And uh, Laura Kreidberg, who is a, she's a postdoc fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian, where I work, uh, had a really great idea. She said, well, let's go and use that Spitzer Space Telescope, that infrared space telescope I told you about. And what we're going to do is we're going to just stare at the planet as the planet uh, spins on its orbit. Because the planet is so close to the star, it's tidally locked, just like the moon is to the Earth. So as the planet goes around, it always presents the same face to the star, okay? And so what that means is if you forget about the star, you actually, over time, just get to see the planet turn on its orbit, okay? If, if the planet has no atmosphere, that means there's a scorching hot day side and an ice cold night side. And if you look in the infrared, that means when you look at the day side, the planet's really bright, and then it gets really dark as you, as you look at the cold night side. If, on the other hand, the planet has an atmosphere, then there is no such day-night variation, or at least much less. So, so what that means is, and, and so she wrote this proposal, and I said, Laura, no, they're not going to give you 100 hours for that idea. It's, you know, it's, it's, they're almost wrapping up the Spitzer mission. Anyway, of course, she, she, she wrote it, and she got the time. And so uh, in December, in December, we're going to get those data. And uh, yeah, don't listen. So in, she, she, we're going to get the data in, um, in December. And that'll be, the first, that'll be the first time, yeah, that's the first time that we have a rocky planet orbiting under the star. And we're going to actually know whether or not it has an atmosphere. So ultimately, we want to get to the point of looking for, for like oxygen right, in the atmospheres of planets. And that will show us that there's life. But you can see how quickly this is proceeding. Only in the last year did we find the first examples of rocky habitable zone planets. Now by December, we're going to make the first study to establish whether or not a rocky planet has an atmosphere. And maybe on time scale, three to five years, we can go and detect things like oxygen, which at least on the Earth are entirely produced by, by life. So, um, so, so I, wanna, I do want to kind of pause and point out that you know, individually, a large ground-based telescope or the James Webb Space Telescope cannot tell us that there's life on a planet. And this is, this is important to understand, okay? And the reason is that they're sensitive to different molecules. So, so, so the Giant Magellan Telescope, okay, the Giant Magellan Telescope, it's actually a great way to go and detect oxygen. And oxygen is very precious because on the Earth, oxygen really is all produced by life. But if you just have oxygen, you can't say that there's life because we can hypothesize it's not what happens on the Earth, but we can hypothesize that there are other ways to make oxygen in the atmosphere. One is if you have UV light shining on water and the water disassociates, okay, water is H2O, if you knock off the hydrogen and send it off to space, you're just left with O2 combined, combined to make the O2. Uh, the oxygen's left, and that would be a way to make oxygen that has nothing to do with life. Uh, there's other ideas about how to make oxygen. So you, you have to do more, and what you need to do is with James Webb, you can detect methane, and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, that puts that oxygen in context, okay? So the idea is together they can get the data that will allow us to conclude that there really is life. The GMT, these large ground-based telescopes that can search for oxygen, and the JWST can put that in context and tell us whether the only plausible explanation for that oxygen really is due to biological activity. So that's, that's the vision for finding life on other planets, okay? Not, it's not spaceships. It's not SETI, it's this very practical approach of looking for what the Earth is, you know, the Earth is broadcasting to space all the time, the presence of life through the chemical signatures in our atmosphere. And we should, we should go and do the same thing and look at other, other alien atmospheres. 
So, um, you know, kind of to step back, um, I think it's really, you know, astronomy is a very special field, right? We, we, uh, we don't often generate a lot of practical uh, goods for society, right? We, you know, I mean, I, I really admire my colleagues who work in the life sciences and are trying to rid us of the scourge of disease or um, some of my colleagues who work in engineering and really are, are making our lives better and more enjoyable through, 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 through uh, technical innovations. Um, what does astronomy do? I, I would say uh, astronomy really is great about allowing us to get at some of the really profound questions, which I started by telling you have been with us for as long as we've been writing down our ideas. Okay? And so um, the connection I'm trying to make here is that you know, these new observatories, those are like our spaceships. These, these observatories, they allow us to see what these planets look like, to imagine that we stand there, to actually identify the conditions on the planets and, and really ask whether or not they have life. So with these new observatories, I think we may, we may make the first discovery of life on a planet other than the Earth. And, and the impact of that is really well beyond astronomy and even science. I think the impact really will change how uh, our, we and our children kind of view their places in the cosmos. So um, uh, part of, kind of the best part of my job is that I get to work with uh, these amazing students from around the world. And uh, you know, in visiting the university here, for the last uh, couple days, you know, I, I can see that like joy in my in my fellow professors here, right, where they're just working with these amazing students at the University of Washington, and um, and so I, before I giving you know a public talk, I wrote a number of my students and I said, look, tell me what you, you know, what are these new powerful observatories? What does that mean for you, thinking about the future? And so these are some of my former students and what they wrote back. Okay, so this is Heather Knutson. Uh, Heather was a graduate student with me. She's now a tenured uh, professor at Caltech. Uh, and here's what she said. She said, there's nothing like staying up all night on top of a mountain to observe a new planet. You can walk outside and say, there it is, that star. We're exploring new worlds and traveling to a distant mountaintop to use one of the world's largest telescopes as part of that process of exploration. So for us, the telescopes really are like these spaceships. They really are this magical way to travel to distant worlds. And if you've never, if you've never gone to an astronomical observatory and, and spent the night there, it is, it is, It'll blow your mind. It is magical to be that close to the stars. Um, uh, this is Elizabeth Newton. Uh, Elizabeth um, uh, just moved October 1st to Dartmouth, where she's starting a professorship there. Uh, she said, because uh, I asked her, you know, she was always uh, complaining about the weather in Boston. And she said, look, when we look up at the night sky from Boston, you see maybe a dozen stars. But if you go somewhere where it's really dark, you'll see thousands. But that's just a small fraction of what's out there. Using an astronomer's tools gives us a new way to look at the night uh, sky. Um, so these were students from a few years ago. Um, and then uh, one of my current uh, graduate students, Hannah Diamond Lowe, she wrote back with a great answer. So I wanted to share this. You know, I, I want to share this excitement that these students feel. And what Hannah said was, she was down observing actually at the Magellan, our Magellan Observatories, twin telescopes in Chile, um, which I'm showing here. These are the Magellan telescopes. Uh, and she said, spending time at one of the biggest telescopes in the world has given me a grand perspective on the accomplishments of humanity. From this vantage point, detecting signs of extraterrestrial life seems well within our reach. There's, there's Hannah. So, um, you know, what's amazing to me, like I don't think of myself as being very old, okay? I'm really old for the field of exoplanets. But, but when I started graduate school, just detecting like a Jupiter seemed outlandish. And here's a student only, when did, I, when did I do graduate school? So, so, so like, tw like not even 20 years later. And for her, the idea of what I've just told you about, of actually going and looking for life through, through our telescopes seems entirely reasonable, okay? Um, I want to, uh, I really want to thank uh, uh, the funding uh, that has made all this work possible. I've covered, there's a lot, of, a lot of work that's gone on, and I was kind of just hitting the high points. I do want to point out, um, what has been essential in astronomy is having funding from both the federal agencies and from, from private donors and from private foundations. And so um, this work was supported by the National Science Foundation and by NASA, but also by the David and Lucille Packard Foundation and the John Templeton Foundation. And, uh, and, and I didn't do this work. I didn't do this work. I get to work with the most amazing people, and, and these are their names, Zachary Berta-Thompson, 
Jason Dittman, Courtney Dressing, Raphael Haywood, Jonathan Irwin, Mercedes Lopez Morales, Christo Mant, Elizabeth Newton, Joey Rodriguez, who's given the colloquium on Wednesday, I think, and Jennifer Winters. Uh, they, uh, they, they're, they're, I was showing you their work. Okay, so, uh, so to wrap up, okay? So, th so this is stuff you wanna be talking about at breakfast tomorrow, okay? <laughs> yes, this is what you're gonna talk about, or tonight even, but these are the high points. Okay, so, so the big takeaways, right? Big discoveries, red dwarfs are the most common star in the galaxy by a long shot, and there's at least one habitable planet for every four red dwarfs. That's number one. Number two, we have begun to find the closest transiting Earths, okay? And we're planning to study their atmospheres with the next generation of powerful telescopes. So just in the last year, we have found examples of these habitable rocky planets, and we are building currently the observatories that will allow us to get at their atmospheres. And number three, the search for atmospheric biomarkers such as oxygen will be humanity's first attempt to really answer this, this great question about whether or not we are alone. Okay, with that, I wanna thank you and ask if you have any questions. So now it's time for David to take questions for the audience. We have two microphones um, at the sides of the room. So if you have a question, I would like to invite you uh, to line up at the microphones. We have plenty of time for questions. And we'll just go back and forth so you can start. Hi. So you're saying that the, the one in four for the red dwarfs, but are the orbital planes always in line with yeah. our viewing? I mean, aren't great question this way? Right. So so one in yeah. So one in four of these red dwarf stars has such a planet. Does that mean that one in four transit? The answer is no. So only about one in fifty uh, transit. So only one in two hundred or so will actually have the planet and show it to us. So, uh, so that's right. So most of them don't eclipse, but, but the subset that does, that's the, that's the ones where we're going to do these observations. Yeah. And in fact, recently we discovered, not, not we, but the community discovered that the closest star to us, which is a red dwarf, which is called Proxima, has a planet. It doesn't look like it transits, but it has one of these planets. So they really are very common. The uh, planet that had the sexy name. Right. How far away is that planet? What's the distance? Oh, so that's uh, 12 parsecs away. So that's really close. So that, so they. What's that mean? I don't know what a parsec is. Right. So, so that's. Uh, uh, parsecs three light. Years. Yeah, like right. So like 35 uh, light years, 40 light years. But the, but the very. I mean that's 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 basically. Um, okay. So if if uh, if. If I shrunk the entire galaxy, if I took the entire galaxy and I shrunk that down to the size of the United States, okay, so like Los Angeles to Boston, that's one edge of the galaxy to the other, that planet would be like walking across Central Park in New York. That's how far, that's how close it is to us, the distance across Central Park compared to the distance across the United States. Um, I've heard the, um, the, prospects for finding habitable planets around red dwarfs criticized on what <laughs> this is um on the ba on the basis that because these questions are supposed to be monitored oh. <laughs> <laughs> that because red dwarfs are very volatile stars and planets in the habitable zone are very close to them yeah. that um solar flares from red dwarfs would likely strip them of their atmospheres um what reason is there to believe that a planet in the habitable zone around a red dwarf can sustain an atmosphere? Yeah, that's a great, great question. So um, do red, so red dwarfs make planets, they've got planets that are the same size and temperature as the Earth. Are they good parents? Do they actually allow those, parent, those planets to flourish? Uh, so they, they have been much maligned over the years, it is true. Uh, red dwarfs have personality and they do, uh, they do have large flares and ultraviolet light. Um, uh, um, I, I, I do want to point out that actually 
one of, one of the centers of excellence for actually understanding exactly that question is the University of Washington, that the astrobiology group here really, really is leading the charge on understanding exactly those kinds of questions. Do, does it mean they lose their atmospheres, or if they do keep the atmospheres, it's still not hospitable? And a lot of my answer I'm about to tell you comes, comes from their research. Um, so, uh, yes, I say it was common wisdom like 34 years ago that you shouldn't look at red dwarfs. Um, but no, the answer is when we look in detail at red dwarfs, they actually don't flare as much as people had thought. And actually, once they're, once they're relatively old, they calm down, they never flare, they spin very slowly, and they have very little uh, UV light. So actually, once they're, modestly, once they're moderately old, they're very, very quiet. Um, and so uh, that, that star that I was telling you about, LH 1140, our sun spins every 25 days. That star spins every 130 days. That's how calm it is. And it never, in the entire four years we've been looking at it, it never has had a flare. So, so uh, M-dwarfs get a, get a bad reputation. But when they're young, they do flare. And the question is, can the planets survive this kind of turbulent youth and, and still then emerge to, to being habitable? And we don't know. And so ultimately, I would say, it's a great thing to be worried about. We need to go do the experiment. And sadly, we might learn that they don't allow life, but, but, but it is where we should begin looking, because that's, that's currently where we, where we can look. Uh, next, we're you're on this side, yeah. If you were a betting man, how long do you think it will be before we uh, find one? How long do you think it'll take? So I'm not a betting man. <laughs> All right, so next question. <laughs> no, uh, so, so it's a great question. Of course, that's what keeps me up at night, like literally, because I'm an astronomer, it keeps me up at night. The, um, I would, uh, so I would say, I, I, uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think many astronomers will concede one opinion or the other. I, I actually am open-minded. I actually think that uh, it, we may find the first, the, the first planet we look at, where we actually have the sensitivity, we could find life, and, and basically, there's lots of reasons to think that life is very robust. Once you have roughly the right chemical mixture of elements, you've got sort of the right temperature, you've got liquid water. I mean, look how quickly life took hold in the Earth. Life is inevitable. On the other hand, I wouldn't be surprised that we look at 10 and then 20 and then 100 of these exoplanets and don't find life and learn that life is actually, it was a very rare event on the Earth. Um, importantly, it's not the case, you know, often people get into an argument about numbers. And they say, well, uh, there's 300 billion stars in the galaxy, and there's 300 billion galaxies, so then the probability would have to be like vanishingly small for there not to be life. That's not a good argument to me because I need to be able to measure it. And so my observable universe is not 300 billion. Uh, it's, it's, it's just the local region of space where my telescopes can actually probe. And so in that case, it's only thousands of stars. So we really might find that among the closest 10,000 stars or even 500 stars, whatever it is, that there just isn't one with life on it. And so we are effectively alone. Yeah. I realize it's not your area of expertise, but are there opportunities to find signs of life in our own solar system? And are people looking? So, so the great thing about being a Harvard professor is I can speak forcefully about things that are not my area of expertise. So, <laughs> so I, I think that. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a fascinating question. I think, I think that, of course, a big part of what NASA does, so astrophysics is just one quadrant of NASA. And a lot of, a lot of our effort uh, to explore the solar system, of course, is led by NASA. So, so yes, there are very exciting opportunities to look for life uh, on um, uh, uh, Titan is one idea. Uh, that's the moon of Saturn or Enceladus uh, or Europa. So Europa is a moon, one of the big moons of, of Jupiter where we know that there's liquid water under a, a fairly thick ice la layer, several miles. Um, and and uh, missions are proposed and debated. The difference is that if there is life, it's very different than life on the Earth. So it could be that there's life there, but it's, you know, what we're interested in is like life that's so prevalent, it's radically changed the surface of the Earth. I and mean, if you're an alien looking at the Earth, the continents are green instead of brown. Like life is complete, is the, 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 the most active molecule in the atmosphere is oxygen, it's made by life. When you're going out into the solar system, we know that life is not abundant anywhere else. Could it be hiding in a little crevasse or something? Yeah, maybe, but we have to design experiments that can find life that's quite different. So we don't know, we don't know, and we should definitely look. And that's why we, I would advocate both approaches. We should look within the solar system for life that's very different, and we should look outside the solar system for life that's very much like life on the Earth because we would know how to recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Could you talk about observing the reflected light from these transited, transiting exoplanets as they pass behind the star? Yeah, sure. So my first project in graduate school was to actually look for reflected light, uh, look for the light bouncing off a planet. And in that case, it was actually because when these signals were first discovered, uh, these, this wobble signal, there was a big debate. And some astronomers said, it's not, those are not planets. That's a kind of stellar pulsation, and we've just been fooled. And finally, the reflected light would prove it. And actually, I, I, I was tortured by this, because I lived in a big student co-op. I lived with, with 20 other students. And every day, we'd all cook dinner together. And I'd come home, and they knew I was looking for reflected light. And they'd say, Dave, did you find the planet? And I'd say, no. And they'd all laugh. They'd be like, ah, ha, 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 ha. And then we'd have dinner, and I'd go to bed and get up and do the same thing. It, it, took, it was 15 years later that somebody measured the reflected light. And, 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 and it just required much more powerful telescopes. So, so yes, we absolutely do. We see the reflected light uh, spectra. We, we, see, we see light bouncing off the planets. And that's interesting because it tells you about the scattering in the atmosphere. We also, the related idea is we see the thermal emission. So the idea is instead of the planet going in front, when the planet goes behind in the infrared, its light disappears. So there's a moment of time where you just get to see the star. And then when, the, when they're both in view, you get the light together. But if you subtract them, the light from the star goes away, right? Because it's in both those images. And you're just left with the light of the planet. And that's, and that's a, a, a well-established technique to actually get the emergent spectrum of the planet. So we have many different ways to get in the, the atmosphere. The one I highlighted in the talk was the transmission. But you're exactly right. The, the, the passage of the planet behind the star gives another opportunity. And of course, most, most planets that go in front of the stars also go behind the stars. So, so they're complementary. They don't, they don't always. They don't always. They actually, the orbits don't have to be that way. But mostly they do. So, Yeah. Um, I've read stories about like the Watson supercomputer and people are like, oh, it's, it's better at identifying tumors than professional cancer doctors. Uh, if it's not already, do you think a similar kind of AI could be applied to finding exoplanets? Oh, uh, great question. So, so, I, um, so it's certainly true that um, there's been a lot of innovation in computational techniques and we have profited from that and sometimes we've been the innovators. Uh, um, we do use supercomputers in the, in the case of Kepler there was a postdoc working with me, a guy named Francois Fressin. And one of the tricks with um, uh, these planets is that when you're looking and you see a blip, instead of it being a planet going in front of a star, it can be this, it can be this um, uh, tricky uh, system that fools you, where basically you're an eclipsing binary of two stars that go in front of each other. But there's a third star along the line of sight, and all that light gets mixed together, and the eclipse gets diluted. And the way you rule those out is you have to basically consider the, the universe of possibilities of, of those and, and weight the probabilities. And so basically, we use the supercomputers at, at uh, NASA Ames Research Center uh, in the Bay Area to, to answer those questions. So, so we, do, we, do, we do use a lot of these innovative techniques in, in trying to process our data. And, and they do find planets that I think the human eye misses all the time. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, minor point, but uh, it, uh, didn't, I didn't uh, couldn't figure out why you knew that those planets 1140 B and C were in the same uh, orbital plane. Right. So, um, so uh, we uh, can basically constrain that through really high quality data. You can, you can tell the core. So basically, if you picture the star, and as you go across different lines I would draw across the star, the transit will last different durations of time. But there's another independent measure of how quickly the planet is moving, which is actually the ingress, this little brief moment where the planet gets onto the star and gets off the star. That gives you a separate measurement of how quickly the planet is moving. And so basically, once we model that data very carefully, it gives us uniquely what we call the inclination, the tippiness. And in that case, they're exactly aligned. Not, not all systems are. We see systems where the planets are misaligned. And in the solar system, the planets, some of the planets are a little bit misaligned. And, and that's really important. You know, that, those numbers are very important for understanding uh, how the planets formed and how they evolved after they formed, basically whether they were stirred up or not. So. Thank you. So as someone who builds spaceships for a living, don't sell us short. You know, we may get there yet. My serious question is this, as we're studying atmospheres, are we biased by the search for life or will the search, will the study of atmospheres be essentially full spectrum where we're looking to really understand the, comp the total composition of these planets' yeah. atmospheres? Yeah, so on, on, I mean, on, the, on the spaceship question, again, I'm not saying we shouldn't pursue it. I'm just saying it's not the way to first find life. 
So I'm definitely not uh, poo-pooing those ideas. Uh, just that the way to do this, the, this, this stuff, this stuff can come to fruition in 10 years, maybe less. And the spaceship thing will take, take longer. In terms, of the, in terms of the atmospheres, so um, basically the, the studying the atmospheres of Earth-like planets is the hardest task. And so by creating that capability, we gain the capability to, to, to study other kinds of atmospheres. Uh, and so um, uh, we have been for 15 years studying the atmospheres of gas giant planets across a wide wavelength range. There are many exciting, here I've chosen to focus on the search for life, but there's many, many exciting scientific questions that have to do with the physics of the atmospheres, how the atmospheres are produced, how the atmospheres are lost or retained, and all those, that sensitivity is, is gonna be available to us as we push on this hardest thing, this kind of most demanding application. It kind of opens up all the other stuff for us. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any challenges with uh, short period variable stars that have similar light curves to transits? Yes, uh, so yeah, so stars are intrinsically variable and in particular they have spots, they have spots. And, and so, you know, in some of those, uh, I can show you light curves where the stars are bouncing up and down. That's actually a, a positive because it tells us how quickly the star is spinning. So we actually get information. Fortunately, it never mimics a planetary eclipse. The planetary eclipse, the, the thing you realize is if this is the star, the planet goes in front, but it's only in eclipse about 1% of the time. The rest of the time, it's over here, it's over here, it's over here, it's over here, and the star looks flat. Whereas a spot is continuously varying. So even if they're at the same period, they have every single spot is going up and down all the time. This eclipse looks like nothing, 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 eclipse, nothing, 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 nothing. So fortunately, we don't get confused that way. Yeah. So speaking of atmospheres, our planet is experiencing some issues with global warming. Has there been any studies about the effects of global warming with our surrounding environment, even though you know the planets are far away from us? Is it insignificant or a nomino to where there might be some concerns or changes? And do we also monitor other planets that go through similar temperature changes? Oh, I history? see. Yeah, so you're asking uh, whether we think about those sorts of changes in the atmosphere as they apply to other planets? Or yes. is that what you're asking? Yeah, what the effects are with global warming with our planet, does it make a big difference for neighboring planets as a whole? Or is it so insignificant that it might not even make any difference? Yeah, so I mean, certainly um, the, so the, the, the composition of the Earth's atmosphere has changed dramatically, very slowly, but over, over time, uh, through life, but also through physical processes, through volcanoes and outgassing and so on. And, and we definitely, there have been very interesting papers written about whether you could see those, so that one of the benefits of astronomy is we can find Earth-like planets of different ages. So we can, we can find planets from other stars and we can guess the age of the star. And we can find Earth-like planets that are only 100 million years old or that are 1 billion years old or 4.5 billion years old or 10 billion years old. And we hoped by basically putting together this, this family, well, this, this kind of portrait of planets over time, we could actually see how these atmospheres uh, vary. Um, but global warming, of course, is a much more shorter time scale. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a sort of 50 year time scale. And it definitely would produce observable effects, but they would, they would be pretty catastrophic. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be very different. So. Thank you. So how likely is it for us to find um, life as we know it, and how different could it be? Yeah, great question. Uh, so, so, so thank you. So, so the, the, the strategy I'm outlining is basically that we look for life as we know it. And it's not, I'm not saying that other kinds of life can't exist. In fact, life could be extremely diverse throughout the galaxy. It's that I haven't been able to think of an experiment that would allow me to recognize that life. So I start with what I know. I start by saying, look, I understand the Earth system. I could recognize, I know what the combination of gases are that I have to detect. That would allow me to say, okay, that's also going on on this other planet. I'm, I'm really hopeful that other future students, like yourself, are gonna come up with those ideas about what, what, how do we actually now go and find other, other signatures of, of other kinds of life 
life that isn't on the Earth, but we'd still feel confident that we'd be able to infer it based on data we can realistically get with our telescopes. Thank you. Uh, yes, you say habitable planet. I'm just wondering if we were to stand on one of these planets, could you speculate on what the conditions would be like? Huge tides, a very dim star maybe, right. uh, ice, uh, these kinds of things. Yeah, so, so uh, that's right. Habitable does not mean pleasant. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, I grew up in Canada. Uh, it's in the habitable zone, <laughs> sort of. Uh, but no, it's, 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 a, it's a great question, so, uh, so that's right. So um, for these red dwarf stars, I think there would be a permanent day-night side. So on some parts of the planet, you would always see the sun, and on other parts of the planet, you would never see the sun. Uh, so that would be very different. Uh, the, the, the sun would be very red, so much more of the light comes out at redder wavelengths. Uh, there's still plenty of light to do things like photosynthesis. Um, the overall amount of light wouldn't be any dimmer, right? The planet still gets the same amount of energy. It's just that more of that energy is at, is at red or an infrared light as opposed to, as opposed to optical light. Uh, and the star, the star would be bigger in the sky uh, because we're close. Even though the star is smaller, we're actually quite close to it. The star is bigger in the sky. Uh, and, and, and so there would, be, there would be quite a bit of different changes. So it's not necessarily a place that would be pleasant for humans, but it's a place that basically allows liquid water and therefore allows all the interesting chemistry to go on that we think was how life got started on the Earth. So, yeah. Uh, recently there has been news about a possible exomoon yes. that has been discovered. What do you think are the implications of that and how does it relate to possible, you know, more like rocky moons that right. in the future? Yeah, that, just, that was just announced. So that, uh, that's David Kipping. He's a professor at Columbia. He was a postdoc at the Harvard-Smithsonian, uh, and he, he worked on the moon problem for years. And so he's finally saying that he's got enough data to go forward. He himself is, is using kind of somewhat skeptical language. He's not saying this is a slam dunk. Basically, it's a, it's a somewhat weak signal in the data. And it's a strange moon. The moon itself would be the size of Neptune, and it orbits a Jupiter-like planet. So that's really unlike anything. The moons in our solar system are all very small compared to this sort of moon. But he believes he sees it in the original Kepler data and then as a follow-up in the Hubble Space Telescope uh, data. So he's, he's, he's not saying this is absolutely certain. But, 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 but it would be very exciting to find these moons for, for, well, for, for, for reasons that allow us to understand planet formation. So if you look in the solar system, the moons actually are great clues as to what happened in the late stages of formation of the solar system. But also, moons are very exciting because they could be abodes for life, right? So the, the way we talked about here to keep a planet warm is to have it close to the star. But of course, the other way to have liquid water is tidal heating of the moon. So the, so the moons of Jupiter are very cold, but they have liquid water. One of them has liquid water because it's close to Jupiter and it gets squished and stretched all the time like silly putty. And so that generates enough heat that it can actually uh, melt, the, melt the ice. And so that's, that's also a possible new kind of uh, habitable environment. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so I apologize if this is a bad question, but um, given if an exoplanet is close enough to observe and has an atmosphere, is there much opportunity to observe its atmospheric spectra? And if so, can you tell anything about the surface composition of the planet from the spectra itself? That's a great question. Sorry. Never apologize. It's a good, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, the, the uh, so, so yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and in fact, um, I think getting the surface, so the point is yes, if you, if you, uh, you know, basically, so, so spectra basically are colors, understanding colors. And so yeah, if we could, if we could measure the brightness of the planet in different colors, then we could, we could uh, uh, learn something about the surface conditions. And so actually I was part of an experiment uh, uh, called epoxy, which was, there was a deep impact mission. There was a, there was a, there was a mission that was uh, 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 sent out to explore um, the solar system. After it was done, the camera was left over and we used the camera to turn back to the Earth and observe the Earth as it turned on its axis, right? Yeah. And we measured the brightness of the Earth in different colors. And then, Eric Hellman, this was work done here at the University of Washington with Nick Cowan and Eric Agall and others. 
basically what they did is they took the brightness in different colors. Okay, so you just measure how the Earth, you, you measure the total brightness of the Earth in a blue wavelength and a green wavelength. And they said, let's pretend I know nothing about the Earth. Can I make a map of the Earth? Can I make, because it's exciting, right? Because the point is, at some times the Earth looks bright and sometimes it looks faint because it's reflecting. And they actually concluded that the Earth would have a certain number of continents and a certain number of oceans and the continents would be green as opposed to brown due to forests. And it was amazing what you could learn just from basically those spectra. So it was, it was really a really nice study, yeah. proof of concept. That's uh, really cool, thank you. <laughs> so what would you say is the probability of finding a system elsewhere that has multiple exoplanets, kind of like our solar system here that has like nine planets or whatever, and how many would have multiple habitable exoplanets? Yeah, uh, I, I'd say we, the great news is we know about such systems. So I was telling you about this system where we know there's two planets. Um, there's a really exciting uh, other system around a nearby small star called TRAPPIST-1. You probably heard, may have heard TRAPPIST-1. It's got seven planets of which normally something like three are, are sort of roughly in the habitable zone. And there's other systems as well. Uh, certainly from Kepler we see other systems, although those are generally too far away to study in detail. So it looks like these small M dwarf stars are very good at making lots of rocky planets, like a whole standing army of rocky planets, of which a bunch of them can often be in the habitable zone. So you could, you know, in our solar system there's really only one planet in the habitable zone, but it looks like there's other stars where, where multiple planets would be habitable within, around the same star. Um, uh, hi, so you mentioned um, that you have systems in place to figure out the diameter and, you've, and to figure out the, um, so, so basically you can figure out the density of, of the planets, um, also the atmosphere. Once it comes to it, would you be interested in finding out more things about the geology so you can make it more fine grain to know not only whether it's rocky, but what sorts of things are going on and kind of, are, are there kind of any, any expectations that you have us to what sort of geological conditions yeah. would be optimal for life? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Yeah, so, so um, you know, the habitability of a planet, um, of course, depends on much more than it's, uh, whether it's rocky and whether it's uh, temperate. And I think one of the big questions is whether it has an active geological cycle, right? So the, so the Earth has plate tectonics. It means that the atmosphere and the ocean and the mantle, the rocky mantle, are all talking to each other. They're all exchanging gases. And that's really important for the long-term habitability of the Earth. Uh, there's some planets in the solar system where they're no longer geologically active. And, and we think that that's a big reason why they lost their atmospheres. They don't have a magnetic field that protects the atmosphere. And they don't have a way of, like on Venus, once it didn't have oceans, it had no way of getting all that carbon out of the atmosphere. And so it's like Venus and the Earth have the same amount of CO2. It's just that in Venus, it's all up in the atmosphere. Ours is all down in the rocks because of this process. So, so, so I'd love to learn about whether they have active geological cycles, which I would do through magnetic fields. And yeah, through, in, in principle, this reflected light idea would tell you about the mineralogy. But in practice, that's going to be a much more difficult measurement. So, yeah. so let's say this all goes great, and you find exactly the planets you're hoping for with the right amounts of oxygen and methane and any other gases, uh, what do you do next to study those planets and, yeah. and confirm that there's life there? Right, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. And I, and I would say that I, you know, I think that, um, so, 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 for, so, so, so at a basic level, I think there will be the usual scientific dialogue where some of my colleagues will say, I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> and, and I'll say, that's fine, but what's your explanation of the data? and they'll have to propose a model. They'll say, I think it's produced by UV light. And I'll say, great, predict something about your idea. And their idea will predict the presence or absence of some other thing that we can measure. So that's how we will proceed. So initially, we'll have some evidence that there might be life. Somebody will come up with a competing hypothesis. What's exciting about astronomy, I hope, is that those ideas can be differentiated through the scientific process. We can observe something else that we will have to design a new experiment for. So, so that's the big, and, 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 I think, and I think that discovering life on another planet this way is not a simple, like, make a measurement and we're done. It's a slow coming to an understanding that the only plausible explanation is life, that it'll, it'll, be, a, it'll be a probabilistic statement that will take many years to develop. But then the other, the bigger picture question, the, the bigger picture idea is I think going forward, you can imagine all sorts of other really exciting things you'd like to know, like is it multicellular life, and are there animals, and is it DNA based? 
And I don't have a clue how to answer those yet, but I do, I do think that you know, future scientists will, will come up with those experiments. I, I, I'm not able to, but I think that they will. Scientists have already left um, <laughs> the lecture tonight. Um, that was an excellent last, last question. Let's thank David one more time. <laughs>